Good morning and happy Reformation Sunday to all who are watching. Welcome to Emmanuel Live on Facebook Live. We're glad you're with us. It occurred to me this week that um, not everybody who watches is necessarily of uh, Lutheran tradition. So a uh, well, word of explanation for those who are not Lutheran but still care to watch. Reformation Sunday is the day that we as Lutherans commemorate the founding of our Lutheran Church. It was on actually on October 31st of 1517 when Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door of the cathedral in Wittenberg, Germany. And he had nailed these theses to the door because he wanted to talk over some of the concerns he had about the direction the Roman Catholic Church was headed in that direct, at that time. So it is on this day that we commemorate the founding of our Lutheran Church with the nailing of the 95 Theses on the cathedral door. A word of thanks to all have, who have completed the survey. Uh, we've had pretty good response on the um, internet version and paper version that has come back is still is also a pretty good response. There's still time, so please, um, if, if you have not yet, take care of that. Um, the more information, more feedback from uh, the more individuals, the better informed we are when we make our decision whether or not we will be reopening in mid-November or whatever date that may be. So please take the time to do that. If you did not receive it, let me remind you again, contact me in some way, email, text, phone call, whatever. Let me know you didn't get it, and I will see that you do get it. Um, several people did respond to the survey and uh, said that they would be willing to volunteer to assist with Sunday worship um, if and when the services do resume. But since the, the internet version of the, well, the, totally, the, inter, the responses are anonymous, I need you to let me know who you are if you volunteered to help out. Some people in the past couple of months and or the last several weeks have told me they'd be willing to um, volunteer. But I need to know if it's the same base of volunteers as we had before or have we gotten some more. So please send me a text, an email, or phone call. Either way, let me know that, yes, you are willing to, and I will certainly record your names, and then we will be better informed as we make our decision. Um, one more reminder is to get out and vote. The early voting sites opened yesterday, and they go through next weekend. So please get out and vote. As we drove by the church today, or I'm sorry, drove by the town hall on our way to church today, the line was massive. So it's a good sign to see that people are getting out and taking advantage of the opportunity to vote early. If you want to go out today, no rain in the forecast. You can stand in the sunshine. You may even want to bring a folding chair with you to sit down if you think you're going to be sitting for a while. But the line at uh, the Claytown Hall was, was long, and that was before they, they opened the doors to begin the voting. So um, just be prepared that there may very well be lines. You may have to wait a while. But again, those early voting sites are open during the week, so please check the newspaper for the uh, municipality where you live and see the hours of the one, ones closest to you. And then the last reminder for today is that Next week is one of the favorite weekends of the year, and that's when we get to send our, set our clocks back for an hour. So please remember to do that, because otherwise you may be tuning in to watch us on Facebook Live, and it won't be happening for another hour. So please just remember to set your clocks back uh, that hour and get an extra hour of sleep. Although if you're like me, for I think as long as I've lived, I've never taken advantage of that extra hour of sleep. But at least I tell myself, yeah, this is the week, this is the time, this is the year that it's going to happen. So be that as it may, remember to take care of your clocks next weekend. With that being said, I think we better have some church. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who creates, redeems, and sustains us and all of creation. Amen. 
Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and one another. Faithful God, have mercy on us. We confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We turn from your loving embrace to, and go our own ways. We pass judgment on one another before examining ourselves. We place our own needs before those of our neighbors, and we keep your gift of salvation to ourselves. Make us humble, cast away our transgressions, and turn us again to life in you through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. My beloved friends, God hears the cries of all who cry out in need, and through his death and resurrection, Christ has made us his own. Hear the truth that God proclaims. Your sins are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Led by the Holy Spirit, live in freedom and newness to do God's work in the world. Amen. Our hymn for today is, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. I'm sure that doesn't come as a surprise to anybody. And in the red book, it is number 504. In the green book, it is 229. We will begin with the first two verses. Together, let us pray. Almighty God, gracious Lord, we thank you that your Holy Spirit renews the church in every age. Pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep them steadfast in your word. Protect them and comfort them in times of trial. Defend them against all enemies of the gospel. And bestow on the church your saving grace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading for this morning comes to us from the prophet Jeremiah in the 31st chapter. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt a covenant that they broke. Though I was their husband, says the Lord, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel in those days. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts 
and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to one another, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. Here ends the first reading. And the second reading for today comes to us from Paul's letter to the Romans in the third chapter. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For no human being will be justified in his sight by deeds prescribed by the law, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God, uh, righteousness of God through faith in Christ Jesus for all who believe. For there is no distinction since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. He did this to show his righteousness, because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is a righteous, is righteous and that what he justifies, the one who has faith in Christ. Then what becomes of boasting? It is excluded. By what law? By that of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from the works that are prescribed by the law. Here ends the second reading. In the gospel for this morning comes to us from St. Matthew, in the 22nd chapter. Now when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment of the law is the greatest? And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul and with all of your mind. This is the greatest in the first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them this question. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? And they said to him, the son of David. And he said to them, well, then how is it that David, by the spirit, calls him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under my feet. If David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? And no one was able to give him an answer. Nor from that day forward did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. My beloved friends of Christ, here ends the good news that is the gospel of our Lord Jesus the Christ. Thanks be to God. In the name of Jesus, the risen one, amen. We live in an ever-changing world. We like to get information fast. There was a time, and I'm sure most of us remember it very well, that we relied on the daily news broadcasts on television. We relied on the newspaper. 
Some people may not be from this area originally, and some may not remember because they're young enough, but there was a time when in the city of Syracuse, we had two newspapers, morning and evening. And what didn't make it into the newspaper in the morning probably made it into the evening news on the, in the paper. And if it didn't make it into the, the evening paper, it was there for the local news, probably. But time has changed. We want our information even faster than that. We don't want to have to wait for the morning paper. We can't wait for the evening paper because there isn't one. So we, we look during the day and we find that there isn't just a newscast at the end of the day. We find that there are newscasts on first thing in the morning. The local stations all have their version of a, of a local newscast. Many of them have midday newscasts. And then some of them have an early late afternoon broadcast. It's a, it's a quick one. It's at four o'clock usually, and it just pretty much gives us the basic facts. And it's kind of an enticement to tune in. If you want more information, tune in at five o'clock and then watch our hour and a half broadcast to get all the details. And then immediately after the local news completes, there's the nightly news, the evening news with David Muir or whomever the other uh, uh, stations, the other networks have on as their, their anchors. But still, even though that's there, we still look for more information and we want it faster. We want the facts, or at least what we want to believe are the facts. So we turn now, those of us who have access to it, to the internet. You can go to the internet any time of the day and you can get news. If you happen to be a cable subscriber, you can go to one of the 24-hour news networks. We'll tune in every now and again to CNN just to see, okay, what are the top stories? And then we'll look around to get more detail on them. Maybe we go to another TV station. Maybe we go and, and look through the internet for more details. But we're wanting facts. We want more and more information to come in. In the gospel this morning, that's what this Pharisee was asking Jesus, except for he wasn't asking him because he really wanted to know. He was asking Jesus because, as Matthew said very clearly, he was trying to set a trap for him. He wanted Jesus to say something that would entrap Jesus, that would make him look bad perhaps even be something that was blasphemous. But instead, he received a response that there was absolutely no way to debate or dispute. If this dialogue between Jesus and this Pharisee had been a presidential debate, we would hear the question that is posed by the Pharisee, who we know is trying to entrap Jesus, trying to bait him, to say something wrong. But then Jesus comes back with the answer to the question, what is the greatest of the commandments? And Jesus says, to love your Lord, your God, with all of your heart, your soul, and your mind. Couldn't answer that, or couldn't question that. But then he followed it up. Then he took it one step farther, and he said, and the second is like it. The second is, you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. If you were watching that as a presidential debate, you would be cheering, you would throw your arms up in the air and say, yes, Jesus, right answer, perfect, couldn't do better. But the fact of the matter is that what Jesus said in his response to the Pharisee We've known all along. We've heard it all of our lifetimes. 
Yes, we must put God before all else. We must love God with our whole heart, our whole soul, our whole mind. And we heard the second part, to love your neighbor as yourself. Do you remember from Luke's gospel, the story of the prodigal son, when, again, it was a lawyer that questioned Jesus and said, well, well, okay, yeah, we're supposed to love our neighbors, we're supposed to do this, blah, 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 blah. But who is my neighbor? And then Jesus told the parable of the Good Samaritan. The story where it was only the Samaritan that came to the aid of this man who had been beaten and left for dead on the side of the road. A rabbi and a Levite had seen this man and passed him by because they didn't want to risk touching him because he could be dead. And, and that, would, that would defile our bodies to, to have contact with a dead body. So they ignored him. They went to the other side of the road and ignored this man who was not dead at all. But the Samaritan came along and he, he didn't care what this person's country of origin was. He didn't care anything about this person there. He saw him, he was in need, and so he helped him. That's what Jesus meant when he said to love your neighbor. We have been told all of our lives that as Christians, part of our responsibility is to be a Christ-like figure in other people's lives. We've heard it from our childhood. It's not a new concept. But we spend so much of our lifetime trying to find exceptions to the concept of who is our neighbor and exactly what must I do, how far must I go to love that person. And as we do that, as we find exceptions to who our neighbors are and what we must do and to the extent to what we must go to help our neighbors, we do something that is absolutely counter to what Jesus gave as the first of the great commandments. When he said to love your God, with your whole heart, your whole soul, and your whole mind. He was telling us this is the number one focus of your life. And if we are truly being Christ-like, we have to remember that we are created in God's image. But every time we look for and find an exception to who our neighbor might be or how far we must go, we are making a change. We are trying to put God in our image. We are trying to put Christ in our image rather than us being a creature of Christ's image. The other day I was in the grocery line at Aldi's and there was a young mother, a few people ahead of me in the line. And one of the children was crying. One of them was was very anxious to, come on mom, we've got to get going as she's trying to pay for her groceries, she found that she didn't have enough money. And so there were several people standing between me and her. And I listened to the people that were ahead of me 
listening to what they said. Why does she have to be here now? I'm in a rush. She's taking up my valuable time. Didn't she check to see how much money she had before she left the house? Wasn't she keeping a running total of how much she had in her cart so that she wouldn't be short? Those were the people who were trying to put Christ in their image. What they wanted. What they thought should be the outcome. But very thankfully, the person that was standing in line directly behind her looked to the cashier and said, how much is she short? And I didn't hear the cashier's response, but I did see this other person go into his wallet and take out some denomination of money and hand it to the cashier. And the woman who was clearly frazzled and feeling embarrassed because she was holding up this line. And I might add that some of these people who were making these comments were doing it in a quite audible voice, so she had to have heard it. And she simply turned to this person behind her and said, thank you. My beloved friends in Christ, we don't know who our neighbor is going to be. Our neighbor is whomever is brought into our life so that we may come to their aid. We can stand here and say, I do love God with my whole heart, my whole soul, and my whole mind. But there's more. Have you ever imagined, and if not, we should try to imagine it all the time, that God puts our neighbors in our lives for the sole purpose of our showing what love of God is all about. My beloved friends in Christ, our neighbors are everywhere. They may look differently than we, they may speak differently than we, they may come from different social classes in our society. But they are all our neighbors. And when Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself, he means all neighbors, all the time. Amen. Let us continue with the prayers. Drawn together in the compassion of God, we pray now for the church, the world, and for all those in need. Renew and inspire the church in the freedom of the gospel, O God. Where the church is in error, reform it. Where the church speaks your truth, strengthen it. Where the church is divided, unify it. Ignite in us the working of the Holy Spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As the earth grows through change and transition, as mountains shake and the waters roar, may we care for this planet as a holy habitation for all living things. Sustain all peoples and lands recovering from natural disasters of any kind. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide areas of the world divided or traumatized by conflict, especially in our own land. Free all from slavery, slavery and human trafficking 
and protect all in, God, in harm's way. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Release those living in bondage to debts, chronic pain, or addiction. Grant healing touch to those who are ill or injured. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In this family of faith, we give thanks for our courageous voices that have remained firm in their commitment to the one who frees us from sin and death. Centered in your grace, unify us in the hope of the gospel. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Today, we continue to pray for all those recovering from illness or injury. Today, we especially lift up Sam Vaughn, Shirley Budenhagen, Shauna, Kathy LeVere, Rose and Jerry Perry, Al Heller, Sandy DiBianco, Waldemar Friedrich. We lift up our prayers for all those who are recovering from or will be undergoing surgeries or medical procedures this coming week. And we continue to pray for the family and friends of Anne Wright and any others that we know and loved who have died this past week. We remember in our prayers those for whom this life of quarantine and separation is a time of, of deep loneliness. Let us reach out to them and bring the peace of Christ into their lives. And for those whose homes are not safe havens, especially those living in abusive homes and relationships. We continue to pray for the safety of students, faculty, support staff of all schools, colleges, and universities, that all may remain free of the ravages of COVID-19. And let us be reminded that even as we gather in our own homes, rather than together in our church building, we are more than ever called to be your church. Let us be bold enough to continue your work in our communities in ways that may be new or untried to us. We pray for all those who are serving in the military and their families, and we lift up our prayers for their safety and well-being. Let all homecomings be joyful ones. And as they serve throughout this world on our behalf, we pray for a lasting peace in our time. And we pray now for any and all whom we name aloud or in the silence of our hearts. Even in death, you free us and you give us a place in your house. We give thanks for our ancestors who have shown us truth and freedom. Especially today, we lift up Martin Luther and all those who worked for the renewal of the church. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you see that we need, we entrust to your mercy through Christ our Lord. Amen. And Lord, remember us in your kingdom and hear us now as we pray together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. My beloved friends, may our ever faithful and loving God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you and lead you into the way of truth and life. Amen. In the final two verses, we shall sing of a mighty fortress is our God.
Sisters and brothers in Christ, go in peace, share the good news, for God is with you. And love your neighbor. Thanks be to God. Amen. Have a great week, everybody.